Right, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the first in a series of A Alumni Advice Talks. This series is for students, recent graduates, and anyone interested in hearing from A alumni who graduated in the last recession, 2008 to 2010, who will speak about their experiences in steering their careers through challenging economic times, much like ours today. In this first talk, we have the pleasure of speaking to Arthur Mamumani, who graduated from the AA in 2008. He is the founder and director of Mamumani Architects, specializing in a new kind of digitally designed and fabricated architecture. He is a lecturer at the University of Westminster and owns a digital fabrication lab laboratory called the Fab Pub. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce, and he is a gold winner of the American Architecture Prize for the Wooden Waves Project installed at Bureau Happold Engineering and a recipient of the Reba Journal's Rising Stars 2017 award. My name is Gosha and I'm a graduate for this year's Diploma School cohort um, and I will be hosting this session. And the setup for this talk is such that we will hear from Arthur first, then I will ask a couple of introductory questions and whoever would like to ask further questions should raise their hand on Zoom. I think that's like the little hand. Um, I will unmute you and you will be able to speak and ask away. There is also the option to ask questions in the comment box if you are unable to raise your hand and I can read those out. Although I would say if your microphone is working, please join in the conversation. So Arthur, you can go ahead. Uh, fantastic, Gosh. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll, I'll get started with my timer. Um, it's very special to, to do this. Uh, I graduated 12 years ago and I never had a chance to kind of tell the journey really. So this is quite an honor and uh, I'm so happy to be speaking to students about the challenges of graduating during a crisis, hence the title. Uh, so that's where I'm calling from. <laughs> Literally surrounded by what you're seeing on the screen to give you a little sense of our office. Uh, we've got models everywhere. We tried and I don't know if you guys still have a beautiful fab lab, right? Like I remember at the time uh, at the, uh, you know, I used to go there all the time, but we were being taught technology that I was wondering how on earth I'm going to use it in practice because a lot of the offices that I joined weren't. Sorry, I think we lost you, Arthur, for a second. You became muted. Um, I... Yeah. Am I, am yeah, I less okay. muted? Yeah. Okay. Now you're on muted. You might have pressed something to mute yourself. Okay, fantastic. So I guess I was just uh, talking about how the idea of creating an ecosystem of uh, companies happened. Really, I didn't mean to start companies. <laughs> uh, the idea was to uh, use this rising technology of 3D printing, laser cutting, and see what it is we can do with it as architects, because that's something we weren't being taught. We were being taught the technique, but not the, the purpose in our job. And so I wanted to democratize that and to see, I guess I was just excited. So the Fab Pub idea really started by the idea of democratizing fabrication. I'll, I'll get you through that journey, but then I started freelancing here and there, and then people started appreciating the work and many emerged out of this. Uh, but it wasn't just that, right? I was teaching at University of Westminster. I was giving Grasshopper workshop on Saturday. I started writing software with a friend like you never know where things are going to catch you know uh, where things are going to happen uh, what will be successful so in a way I guess <laughs> uh, I don't know if I could go call it a kind of octopus strategy but really I, I, I was just doing what I enjoyed and and really the consequence of this was just companies rising because there was a need that happened through that so Whoops, sorry, here we go. Um, one one last. So this is downstairs. I showed you the upstairs. This is downstairs. Uh, we have huge 3D printers. Uh, I kind of felt that that technology was changed in scale and that slowly we'll have access to much bigger versions of this. First thing I did when I kind of quit my job was to start assembling a printer. And everyone thought it was a bit little, a little bit crazy about that. And, uh, but I'm really happy to see that things are growing up in scale. And I had the opportunity to be challenged in terms of scale. Um, and so this is a, a robot we've developed with Arup. We actually pitched for this. <laughs> And they actually gave us money for it. Uh, and the idea was to assemble and disassemble stuff. Um, and so this is a, a kind of version. Often we learn things like Arduino and Firefly, and we're like, how on earth am I going to use that in practice, right? And, uh, and the truth is what you're being taught is how to create your own technology, how to redefine the world, right? Often we're being told uh, what you do is impossible, or it's not architecture, or this and that. And 
the truth is everything is architecture and everything can be changed. And what you're being taught at the AA, what I thought was really special is that they don't try to think, is it architecture? I remember when I uh, graduated, I sent a message to Brett Steele, the director. And I was like, one thing I realized at the AA is that anything is an inspiration and that anything can be architecture. Uh, and so for me, that was something really important when I started teaching as well. <laughs> and uh, we're a little bit crazy, but I don't know if you know about Burning Man, the, the event in the US. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a uh, wild event because we go to the desert, build a city with 70,000 people and then kind of burn some of it and, and like leave no trace. I'll speak a bit about it later on, but these are some of the projects we did with, uh, with the students um, and then later on with the practice. Um, so I'll take you through that journey. This was a little bit of, a, of an intro on what it is that we're doing. Uh, this is how kind of it started, shop windows. Uh, you know, if you were told when you graduate, you want to do a few shop windows, how many of you will say, well, that's not architecture, is it? And, and, and the truth is the RBA paired us up uh, it was the crisis, so the RBA paired us up with some some uh, practices, uh, some uh, companies on Regent's uh, Street, and that's how I got to go do the the Magic Garden at the top right here, and and this kind of led into this kind of small scale. The truth is, the printers, laser cutters were so small that we couldn't do giant architecture from it, so we had to sort of rethink how to do stuff. So we even did like a, a restaurant where we 3D printed the food, for example. You see, um, and so that was kind of the journey before I started being kind of commissioned the uh, larger stuff. This is a, a, an actual flat in, uh, in South London. Um, and we started realizing that if we want to do this at a bigger scale, we need to be the contractors of our project. And that comes with a whole wide range of uh, issues, <laughs> which I've learned the hard way in the desert. And I'll take you through that journey as well. Um, we were lucky to be asked with my colleague Toby to design the actual University of Westminster's extension. Uh, and so honestly, although it starts small and stuff, things grow, things uh, emerge from it. People start to appreciate your approach. And that's something I've realized with time. Um, and the truth is with parametric design, as you know, I, that's the kind of stuff we do. I know this word can be uh, uh, applied in different ways, but for me, parametric design is the idea of creating systems and not forms. So to get a little bit closer to natural systems, really that ultimately what I think it does, the, the, the sort of um, result of this is that it created an ecosystem of people sharing stuff, sharing code, uh, sharing, uh, I don't know, um, knowledge. Um, and so this you probably all know about Grasshopper. It's uh, definitely been defining my career um, to levels that I would really not expect. I also kind of thought it was interesting that there was a community of makers out there. I am in East London. We have the FAP up here. There's machine rooms next door. There was hackerspace next to me. And so there was really a sense that although there's also a, there's a digital revolution, but there's also a kind of um, decentralization of, of manufacturing. And, and that was something that I really learned at the AA through the Fab Lab. I mean, I printed my first 3D prints uh, in intermediate unit eight when uh, my teacher, Eugene Ann, like he came back with a, and I, it's like I had this crazy shape and I'm like, oh, Eugene, how am I going to make that? And he's like, do you want to 3D print it? And I, I, had, I had really zero idea about it. And I, I just I looked at him with big eyes. And I think because uh, the teachers are so um, aware of the new technologies and it's such a curiosity that is, is amazing. At the, at the time at the AA, we had Neri Oxman, who was about to graduate. We had, uh, you know, Ahim Menges, who was uh, leading um, unit, uh, Diploma Unit 4. Uh, there was a sense of excitement around technology and around its potential. And we were doing crazy geometries and we didn't know if it would end up with, uh, and I remember someone getting his diploma with a wall. Uh, Daniel Kopf Divila, uh, he got his AA honors uh, with a wall. And, but the wall was incredible. It was an incredible wall. Like, it was like uh, the most amazing wall you can imagine. But isn't that amazing that you can graduate with a wall if you do this so well? Isn't it better than thinking I have to do an airport? I have to do a, I thought that was a special thing. And um, so, uh, you know, time went by, uh, I, you know, we set up the Fab Pub, which is where you can rent machines and so on. Um, and then <laughs> one of the beautiful thing that I realized is we could, uh, crowdfund our projects. So we didn't have to wait for clients, right? We could raise funds for our students, for ourselves, and realize our visions. And that's a really important aspect of uh, the new generation. Like you guys have access to uh, ways of financing that are much more uh, grassroots, much more bottom up. All right, 
I'll take you back to my diploma project because I have to. <laughs> so this is a diploma 2008, a bit of a dinosaur of a project. Uh, and this is called Generative Components. I'm a geek. My dad was a, it was a computer scientist. Uh, you know, my uncle is a computer scientist. My, my brother is into, into mathematics. Um, I don't know if the AA still kind of pushes that. I, I hope so, because this was just a special time. Like we were linking the sun with our models. We were looking at how geometry can be associative. So how things can be linked to each other. And our task that year was to study uh, Oscar Niemeyer. Those are actual pages from a portfolio, by the way. And there was a financial crisis. Uh, and, and, and before that, I, I looked at alternatives, like uh, financial um, uh, alternatives, like what is communism, for example? Uh, how, for example, this was the, uh, the headquarters of the Communist Party um, in, in Paris. And they were going uh, really badly financially. They were about to sell it. And so I thought, well, could there be alternatives to that? And then I, I kind of, and that's something I guess I recommend to you guys is bring your own experience. That was the president of France at the time <laughs> who was saying we're going to uh, cancel the, the heritage of uh, May 68. May 68 in Paris is the reason my parents met. Yeah, they come from very back, different background. My dad is Tunisian. My, my mom is French, both different religions. And uh, without that freedom and open-mindedness of the time, I wouldn't even be here. So this is how kind of intimate it gets when it comes to um, the, the, you know, this, this, this kind of topic of alternative ways of thinking or, um, you know, what I've learned later on at Burning Man and so on. Um, so a good thing is with the tools, I could challenge a little bit the ambitions of Oscar Niemeyer in terms of the, the technical aspects, right? Like, is the building uh, matching its environmental credentials? Um, this is an analysis of the temperatures of Paris. This is a, a sort of component that was here to help and understand uh, how to get, uh, you know, to close the light during winter, uh, to, during summer and, and let it through during, during winter. I'll pass you all the details. You're probably much better now at what I, uh, whatever I was doing than uh, you are. But the idea was to create a public ground for discussion and assemble that together. All the people would assemble that project and it would change according to the program behind it. I was very excited. I was like, oh, I'm going to work for Zaha, Rogers, Foster, who knows? And then this happened, right? 2008, uh, about September 2008, I think, if I remember, um, I got an interview with uh, Rogers, super interview, two, two hours of it, and then receive a call two weeks later, we're not hiring anymore. And then no one hires, right? And so I ended up in a practice, and uh, I'll, I'll keep it short, but I ended up in a practice that I was not expecting. And the good thing there is that because it was not the kind of practice that every AA graduate wants to go to, um, I, I, guess, I guess I became a little bit special there in a sense that I had skills that no one really um, had, right? So I, I was put on a beautiful project, which uh, I don't have here because I, I want to focus on the later part of the, of the work. But um, basically, it's sometimes better to be in a place where you're valued for what you bring than to be in a place where you're surrounded with people that are a little bit similar to you in a way. <laughs> so that's my advice. And what happens is very quickly, I guess, uh, um, I got noticed, I guess, uh, one could say through hard work and, you know, and, and, and showing the capability of that technology and doing workshops on Saturdays and so on and so forth. They, like I was saying in the intro, there was no shortcut to hard work. Um, and so this was Karen Millen, the RIBA, you could send your, they did this thing where you can send your portfolio and they pair you up with a, uh, with a shop uh, shop owner, this time was uh, the, the fashion brand Karen Millen. And I showed them this animation, which was just something I, I show in class. Where, uh, this is called the, sm the smoking, uh, sorry for the bad quality, but I just wanted to show you that at the time we, when we were commissioned that we had to do a 30 meters long uh, shop window uh, in like no time, pretty much for free. Uh, Karen Millen would pay for the materials um, so we had to find the cheapest, so although I speak about technology and stuff, at the time to do this would have been uh, extremely expensive. So I had about 8,000 pounds of budget and no, no fees. But here, here is the thing, right? Like it's not um, about immediate return, right? Like when you do something, don't think of the immediate money you're getting. The truth is at the time I lived in a tiny little place, you know, I, I was eating like sardines or whatever. I knew that what this would cost me now has nothing to do with the monetary value that you get on the long run. And to be honest, monetary value is a very bad criteria for architects because otherwise you'd be a banker, right? You have to rethink your approach to value. 
uh, architects are here to define new kinds of value because we're in the physical world, right? We're not in a in kind of financial abstract world where what we're after is a direct return on our, uh, you wouldn't do this profession, I know it. Um, so, so try to think long-term, that's really important. So to show you this, this is just the process of that project. I'm not gonna spend AG on this. All I can say is it got noticed, right? Virgin Galactic. Next door, uh, they were passing by and they're like, oh, could you do a hotel uh, for uh, the astronaut before they go to space? <laughs> That's an email I received Friday. Deadline is Monday, right? Uh, you know, when you receive an email like this, you don't just like say, oh, whatever. Why do you tell me short notice, whatever? You just get to work, right? And I, I got to work. This is, uh, you know, um, versions of an idea that passed by because when I studied computer science, we were looking at when I was in, in high school, we were taught about recursion and how vectors could be sent in space and rotated and so on and so forth. And so that was uh, an idea that came from uh, early, early, uh, early age, right? I just remembered how my, my enthusiasm when I saw the computer generate things instead of me drawing things in the computer, the computer just gave, you see? And this idea of letting technology teach you stuff, I think is really interesting, uh, especially nowadays with AI and stuff. Like, that's something I really encourage you to look at. Really important that you start learning code you will be lost otherwise. I'm telling you right now, <laughs> if you don't know coding now, go and do it because that's the architects of tomorrow, 100%, no question. Um, and so this was the hotel. Obviously, you'll see the Galaxia project that emerged from this. Soon after, there was an accident. Uh, I think one of the uh, Virgin Galactic uh, um, pilot, unfortunately, uh, uh, died and then they canceled the project and it came back in other forms and I'll show you that very soon, but don't give up. Architecture is not one project, a success or a failure, right? Uh, it's uh, It re-emerges in other places. You have a whole career, a whole portfolio to develop. Take your time. Don't be in a hurry. Like, don't be rushed. Like, develop yourself. Develop yourself personally and in your work. Um, a lot of the new generation I see is so impatient. They want success, they want it now, they don't even know why, but they just want it. <laughs> like, I didn't want to set up a company. Like I told you, I just, I just, it just kind of emerged because of my passion required to start a company. But the company emerged because there was a need for it, not because I was ambitious and I wanted a, a company. That wasn't the case. And people see that, they see humility. They see that you genuinely believe in what you're doing. So all these projects I'm showing you are collaboration, things that I did with some friends. This was just uh, having fun with the laser. I couldn't help it. You know, I spent time with the laser at the AA, so I had to, so I crashed in uh, Arab's uh, laser at the time because I had a friend who worked there. And, uh, and we found this competition after uh, in Shanghai and we started making all these models. I had no idea what I was doing, but I developed this as a kind of uh, almost like a practice. This is called a matrix. So when you deal with parametric design, you're kind of stuck with variations, right? And how do you organize variation is something I learned at the AA. There was this teacher called George Liaropoulos Lejeune who was taking equations and turning them into buildings. And it was a bit like crazy, but I love that craziness. That's the kind of craziness you get at the AA. Um, and embrace it because you're learning. And these people are here for a reason. And, um, and so that's how you can organize this because where when you use like generative and parametric stuff, you have to organize it. Otherwise, how do you make sense of it, right? So this is a we call it a matrix because it's lots of options that you organize, that you label. It also makes you understand what's going on. So these are some of the projects we did, early stages, how to vary parameters. But really what matters is this. We were there with Arup, the entire team, you know, because everyone wanted to volunteer to build this thing, right? And that's a special thing that happened later on at Burning Man is the idea that people love to make things. And that energy, I don't know if you see here, this guy, James Chung, he's now director in my practice, but is a, I mean, this is when you build relationships and really who cares about technology? Who cares about, unless there are human relationships, unless what you do help the planet, unless your agenda is in the right place. Technology is just a, a means, a, a tool. Um, really, if it doesn't help, if it doesn't create relationships, if it doesn't make a better world, forget about technology. Like it, it's not, it's not useful. So I really, it's really important for me to say this because we often get obsessed by tech technology without kind of uh, rethinking of the reason of our obsession or if there is any purpose. That's something I learned, you know, later. Uh, but another neighbor of Karen Millen was uh, wooden, uh, the Burhapol engineering. And they asked us to do the same as Karen Millen, but in wood. 
And so <laughs> I said, yes, but obviously I didn't know how to do it. And that's a little bit like what the architect has to do because we don't sell products, right? So we have to reinvent things. And there's always a risk in that. You're never the expert of your technique from day one, right? So here it is. This is called a uh, curve bending of wood and it's made from uh, just creating little uh, uh, slits inside the wood. It's an open source technique that Aaron Potterfield posted online on the Instructables. And then we started varying it, matrix. And here is a matrix with actual materials. Another thing I learned from uh, George Yaropoulos Lejean. I mean, I can tell you every time I show you a slide, I can tell your teacher associated to it. So you will know, you will remember. So don't, don't be too harsh on your teachers because you'll see, you'll see. <laughs> <laughs> they are the visionaries. Um, but um, yeah, so this is us still building. I had no idea what a contractor was at the time. I was still doing my part three. Uh, but really, we were the contractor. We were installing it ourselves. You can still see them five years later at Burrhapold. This was really a sort of career defining moment because this was a permanent piece, right? And uh, this complexity could only be achieved because we were making the actual objects. We were making them, we were modularizing them, and we were playing with things like AC units, like doors, like projectors. We were playing around. Uh, and, and, and so that was a kind of dance with actual architecture, uh, with a piece that people can see as not architecture. What happened is this was quite successful. They got awards and then uh, other clients started thinking, oh, maybe I can do my bed with this. Uh, maybe I can do my wall with this. And that's when it starts becoming more like a product. And that's good because architects cannot always reinvent the wheel, right? They have to think in terms of business, right? So turning a project into a product is a challenge that I invite you all to look into because that's how you'll make a successful business, right? You cannot just do R&D all the time. I say this, but there was a lot of R&D at the beginning, right? Uh, <laughs> but don't worry, R&D comes back. You know, there's an R&D tax back, so don't worry about that. Uh, the government actually really encourages research. This is Silkworm, a free tool that you can download online, converts polylines into G-code, right? G-code is general code. It allows you to 3D print things directly from lines, from polylines. So it allowed us to create um, unusual prints that you don't have to go through a third-party software like Kura or Slicer and so on. And so you get the code and you design with the code. So you design with the machine. So the machine is also designing. I don't really believe that design is concept and then you give it to a contractor. I think that's a sort of a bit of a pretentious way of thinking of design as if we're the designer and the contractor doesn't do the, any design work or the engineer doesn't do any design work. Everyone does design work, right? Like everything is design. There is no separation between concept and realization. Otherwise you're designing in a vacuum. And that's a real problem of architecture today. And I think um, I'm really here to break that because, and that's why we take risks. That's why we're general contractors uh, because we need to gain back the power of the making and the, the actual, um, realization of our project because otherwise we're we're in trouble right the, the the contractors will build and you will just be concept guys and you just appear with forms and they resolve everything and they get all the money and stuff so be careful about that like you you're putting yourself in a spot by actually trying to stick on the fact that you are the designers like that's an important important point for me to tell you guys um, so basically, when you own the machine, when you send the machines, when you're the contractor, you can do crazy shit. Uh, sorry, excuse my French. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, no, it's recorded. Uh, um, so basically, we sent printers to China here. We, we were monitoring the printers, and we were printing nonstop. Uh, this is a project in Shanghai, obviously smaller scale than later on. But one thing I realized with all this was the saving in carbon footprints, right? You're sending the machines. You're not sending the actual object. So you don't have to go through VAT and so on beyond the machine themselves. And also you can use materials of your choice. You have control over your materials. And that's the idea of life cycle. Now we're all aware of uh, the problems, you know, plastics, pollution and uh, microplastics and, and so on and so forth. And there is this movement called cradle to cradle, uh, the idea of creating circular loops around uh, your projects and your thinking not just of your objects, your project as objects, but thinking about where they come from and where they're going, you know, opening up the entire perspective of your project. This couple with the makers movement creates projects like this one. This is Conifera for uh, COS uh, and it's in, uh, in Milan for the Salone. And uh, one thing that's kind of interesting really uh, is often businesses are after solutions and they hire designers, not just to come up with a shape or they're here to ask, well, what can we do? There's a problem, what can we do? This is the creative director of COS. And I think they were really, uh, 
kind of happy when I went to see them. I said, well, okay, so you're owned by H&M. H&M is doing fast fashion. Can we deal with this in a project? Tell that story. And instead of like closing the door to me, they were like, okay, tell us how we can kind of solve it or how we can kind of deal with it. And that attitude of trying to use a project as a vector for change is something that's extremely important for us. And that's what motivates the team. That's what gets us going. That's why I wake up in the morning. I know that our projects are not just projects. They're here for a bigger purpose, right? So these, these were the modules we were developing. They were the size of our printer. They were extremely thin, three millimeters of cross-section for about a, a four tons of bioplastic. So really, we worked with our engineers format to kind of maximize tension in the structure. We had some uh, crazy uh, grasshoppering together. Uh, we printed these flats. Strangely enough, this was way faster than printing in midair. Um, so it's kind of unusual to use a 3D printer to print flat, but actually it allowed us to actually uh, win a lot of speed. Speed, weight, uh, distribution of, of printing, all these were essential aspects of design. That's why I say that everything is design, right? Um, and so these are the spreadsheets we shared with the local Fab Lab. We were decentralizing the manufacturing of this. Um, and so we were uh, really, um, I'm so, just so, so sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to. Hey, sorry. I, um, so these were uh, about 700 prints that we were printing um, and we basically ended up with something regularly fairly regular but the forces that were going through this are super complex right so credits to our engineers here to work on caramba and give us the complexity to vary these things now remember i mentioned something about like the the sort of scientific aspect that i learned in my geeky years at daa and uh, looking at parameters and parametric design well, imagine if life cycle or our environmental cost was one of the parameters you could add in your model, right? Life cycle assessment, LCA. This is a really important thing and I'll spend a little bit of time just showing you that. I know I still have five minutes, so I'm aware of timing. Uh, but basically you see the difference between PLA here, bioplastic and ABS, right? Something being better than something else is not necessarily one dimension, right? This is multi-dimensional. It's got several aspects that you need to understand. So that's really important. This is a project we're doing this summer. And I'll just kind of take you through uh, uh, the Burning Man world now, because I know I have five minutes, so maybe I can extend it a tiny bit uh, to show you this, because I think it's important. The reason we're going to, uh, to Burning Man, and honestly, I was really not aware of this. This is uh, me and Toby here, uh, my co-teacher, and our students. I was literally teaching them before I jumped on that lecture. Uh, I teach, you know, because I love it, and because I think that you guys are here to be also vectors of change and I think that the more you understand how to be able to change things the more you will do it right often we feel a bit powerless because we're young we're and we're, we're kind of facing big corporation and it feels like it's impossible to to do it well often it's also barriers we put on ourselves right Burning Man is a, is a city that is built in one week uh, by 70,000 people it's got 10 principles and these are principles that then permeated throughout everything, throughout my practice, throughout the office, throughout the, the kind of work we do. Leaving no trace, uh, radical self-reliance, radical self-expression, the idea that everyone can be the artist, everyone can be the designer, even the users, right? There's no spectator. Um, instead of doing art about the state of society, we do art that creates society around it. That's something that the founder, Larry Harvey, said. And it's really, really important because um, something I've learned at the is this idea of self-organization, right? The idea that you put simple rules between things and then complexity emerge from this. Can, I didn't think though, when I learned this at the that it happens in a city and that this is actually something that the founder of the city said, right? And then I slowly realized with, uh, um, with a bit of readings that there's a whole uh, movement, you know, the, the Californian movement, Buckminster Fuller, uh, you know, that uh, taught at the Black Mountain College and Ruth Adawa and a lot of wonderful artists looked at systems as way and craft as ways of creating things. The good thing was when you're a student is you're often, you know, uh, you don't have much money. So you have to come back, come up with solutions that are cheap. And uh, especially in COVID, you're going to have to be inventive. So try not to like think, oh, it's COVID. I can't use the laser cutter. I can't do this. I can't do it. On the contrary, these are opportunities. Right now, what you're doing is so cost efficient that when actually the economy goes better, you'll be on top because you'll know how to do cost efficient stuff. This is a chance, you know, it's not, um, 
it, it is a chance. And you have to see it this way because that positive kind of outlook, the different perspective that you get from it is what's going to get you into uh, a successful um, career, I think. So this is us with the students. I was learning as much as a student, to be honest. It's a little bit pretentious to say I was the teacher. Uh, I was more like the learner. That's why we call it, we want to learn <laughs> with Toby. And we had to live together a little bit kibbutz style. Uh, we had to come uh, through the, uh, the, the dust, the storm, the dust, the, the, the kind of challenges of being uh, in, a, in a sort of 50 degrees environment. Um, and then this happened, you know, you have fishes around you, giant fishes. And it sort of brings a bit of poetry to all that technology. And something that I, I thought was really emotional was this. This is the temple. Um, it's a giant CNC structure this year. Every year there's a different temple. And I thought, whoa, so you can actually do giant buildings with what, you know, with our Fab Lab. This really opened up perspective for me. And I had to go all the way to the desert of Nevada to understand the AA. That's to tell you that it's going to take you time. It's <laughs> so a lot of our students got successful bids. Um, this was one year where we had a really be, a bit of a learning curve where you have, you know, the infinity tree on the left and the bismuth bivouac on the right, super complex parametricism on the left, I guess, and super simple of the shelf timber on the right. Um, and so this was a good lesson, like complexity for its own sake doesn't, doesn't work really. On the right, you have the off the shelf timber, two by four, four by four, super neatly organized. And this one, the project, we didn't finish it. This was a real learning curve for, for this project, Tangential Dreams, that became the project we did just before Galaxia, which uh, on which well, I'm, I'll just conclude that talk if that's okay. So Tangential Dream was people participating, writing their dreams on the tangents. People were involved, right? What people would bring to this project was as important as whatever we would bring. Burning Man appreciated this, I think. And this is the temple. So that's the city of Burning Man. It's a sort of um, a crescent. And then you have here the temple, which is a quiet space where people like reflect in a very deep way. And that's really my first um, encounter with spirituality. Um, you know, of course, you know, I, I grew up with some religion. My dad was uh, Jewish, my mom Catholic, but I always thought that it was very dogmatic. It was, uh, again, the, you know, not the corporation, but the organized religions. And, uh, and that's really the temple at Burning Man was the first time I felt like it was okay not to be okay, that it was okay to cry, it was okay to be human, it was okay to connect with other humans. And, uh, you know, I went through multiple depression, I, I, you know, even at the AA, my fourth year, I had to drop out because I, I went into depression. So I had to go back to Paris, had to go and see a shrink, psychiatrist, everything. It was hard. Like, Because you think when you're, when you're young, you, you really... And it's normal. You just think that everything is on your head crushing you, right? You don't feel like you're part of something or that you can make a change and stuff. And so you go to the street angry often, but really I just wanted to express this in that project that it's okay not to be okay. And so really the dome, this idea of St. Paul's, uh, you know, just kind of, we own the sky was the opposite of what this could be. This could be a sponge. It could be something about accepting people's emotions, starting at the human scale and bringing them up to the sky. Um, and so you can see it's really uh, everyone, like here's a Zoom, you can see all the things that people were putting in there. This was really just a sort of coral, a lattice for people's emotions. So you can see as you came in, you had these tears in the center. Like often people cry when they go to the temple. It's an emotional moment. And I thought it would be nice to actually crystallize this into something technological because one doesn't have to be op opposite of the other, right? The idea was to mimic black holes and galaxies and so on. So the understanding of science doesn't have to be different from uh, the understanding of uh, uh, spirituality, right? Uh, often temples were based on things like uh, the sun, uh, et cetera. So just to give you a little bit of sense of what I think is important as an architect that you need to learn is assembly sequence. How to build a 60 meters wide temple in the desert in 18 days. You cannot escape this. This is a build sequence. You have trucks, you have uh, uh, cars, you have scaffolding. Really, you cannot escape the idea that as an architect, you'll never look at this. And you probably know the famous quote, like how heavy is your building by Buckminster Fuller to Foster. It's so important. It's so important to understand how things will be assembled, especially when it's volunteers. But I would say this taught us how to build things that are kind of, um, if not volunteer friendly, uh, contractor friendly, right? And that's why we could become the contractors of our own world. So these are just a sequencing of how to assemble stuff. The IKEA drawings we had to kind of publish for the, uh, for the volunteers. We had to build full scale stuff. Um, this is the village. We had to build an entire village with tents, car, uh, shop. Uh, uh, this is the scale, right? You can actually kind of get a sense of that scale. And then you had dishwashing and everyone dishwashed and uh, you know, 
you don't escape dishwashing. You don't escape uh, putting the trash where you need to. It's really important that you guys learn to be like humble and part of a team and put yourself at the level of the team. You know, um, often we're out of the AA, the best school in the world. We're like, ah, you know, we have a, a bit of a big head, right? It happens. I know, <laughs> but really go dishwash, you know, with a team of volunteers somewhere, do some volunteer work, like get a sense of what it is to be part of a team of humans that are non-architect, that don't know what X and X or history or architecture is. They're just people that want to build because they, they, they kind of just uh, want to be part of something. They want to be part of a journey. So this is us uh, assembling these giant modules um, modular architecture is obviously much more volunteer friendly. So this is closing one of the gates and try and move on to the next uh, video. But that gate had to be thought in relation to the scaffolding, in relation to the uh, anchors, in relation to not being able to dig in the ground. So there's a lot of parameters in construction. And although you see this simple form, you know, this form um, that you could do on Grasshopper in a day, right? This is not where the value of this project is. It's not in the shape. It's not in the doing it on Grasshopper. It's this, it's the people you're doing it with, it's the, it's the kind of knowledge that you build up as you're building it. It's the emotions that people get inside this building and, and write on the structures. The structure is part, is one element of an entire story. And you realize that when you start seeing messages like this, right? Like someone lost their girlfriend, they're extremely sad, they want to express their emotions and you're giving them an outlet. The project is really just here for the people and what's happening in there. And that takes a while for us to understand because we're expected to do crazy shapes, right? So I got married in one of those uh, <laughs> days where uh, this is my wife uh, and my mom uh, and this is our, this is our marriage. Uh, and I, I just thought it was interesting that it wasn't just about um, grief but it was also about uh, a celebration. So this is a uh, Native American tribe that came and blessed the project. And they told us, you know, I was a little bit kind of surprised they would want to come and, uh, and, and, and kind of bless this building. I said, are you sure? Like, this, isn't this weird Burning Man on your land and stuff? They're like, Arthur, you know that um, a sacred space is a sacred space. No matter what it is, where it comes from, it is sacred. And when, I, when they said that, obviously we all kind of burst into tears, but that was incredible to feel the universality of sacrality and architects can do that. They can do sacred spaces. And we lost, we lost that because basically other values came into the equation, money came to the equation. Um, and we somehow became closed into just doing buildings and forgetting that architects can also change the world, right? Um, we burnt it. <laughs> I went through that image quite fast, but we burnt it in silence altogether. We recycled it. And then the other projects that we've done, and I'll, I'll sort of conclude on that, it's 35 minutes, but the other projects we've done were completely inspired by this idea of modularity, of gifting, of um, creating things that can be disassembled, assembled. Um, and so when we are gonna go back eventually to Burning Man, and I hope some of you can come with us, we wanna build something that we're not gonna burn, but we're gonna disassemble, bring back to London, and have a dialogue between cities, have this uh, moving amphitheater. This is an amphitheater made of amphitheater, no spectators, no actors, everyone part of that. So I'm going to leave it there. And uh, it's 35 minutes, hope it's, I, 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 but uh, I'm open to your questions. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That was um, really, really inspiring, I would say. Um, so, just some uh, housekeeping to start with. Um, a reminder that if you want to speak, please raise your hand on Zoom and then I can unmute you. Um, and I'll just start off maybe with a couple of questions while um, people are maybe gathering their thoughts. Um, so maybe I'll start with this um, idea of kind of um, democracy and reaching out to others in your designs. So I would say that maybe due to coronavirus, a lot of graduates have found that they've had to leave the UK and return to their home countries, either for visa reasons or maybe because London is too expensive to live in without a stable job. And the danger is that we're cut off from um, this design hub that we're used to, that is London. And I was wondering if you have any suggestions for someone in this situation looking to network with other professionals um, in digital fabrication and manufacturing and kind of wider architecture. Um, to kind of maintain this network in a pandemic that you can um, feed off of and feed into, um, but also maybe not just 
networking with other professionals, let's say, but also how do you reach out to engineers, contractors, and the general public who will be involved in kind of designs, perhaps? Uh, it's a super good question. Um, on the digital fabrication side of things, you guys are lucky because you're post the uh, emergence of the uh, Fab Labs, right? So if you go online and you type closest fab lab to my city, I can mm. guarantee you that if you're from one of the larger cities, you'll have a fab lab locally. Just in Italy, for example, I know they have one in every single city, right? So reach out to this local fab lab, try to kind of understand their volunteer. You know, your students at the end of the day, I, I did a, an internship at Zaha. I did it for free because it was my summer. And I know that there's this whole crisis and stuff. But again, remember what I said about monetary value, that is not the only measure of what you're learning. You're still learning right so uh, just you know it's important to know that uh, what you're doing now defines your career right and um and so go and hang out in places where you know you're gonna learn right go and hang out into fab labs then in terms of staying at home there's something really incredible is that there's lots and tons and tons of forums right you can not only build your own little 3d printers just to understand the mechanism of this you know you can go to reprap pro that's the one i built for example and and or the prusa mendel or whatever all the different printers that you have out there and then you have platforms like irc chats on uh and like the most geeky chats out there and you have stack exchange stack exchange is a platform where you have an infinity of uh forums where you can there is a mathematics forum there is a physics forum there is a and you know I think it, it really, in all honesty, although I learned a lot from architects, <laughs> I do learn from people that are mathematician or that are from, be curious, right? Be curious because for example, Grasshopper, if you were to buy a vector geometry book, you'll probably be faster mm. than someone who just learns Grasshopper on its own. Like really mathematics, there's a reason why math is important, right? Like, <laughs> or computer science, right? So go to classes that are completely unexpected. And also those, this is where you're gonna meet your, your future clients, right? If you go to a C-sharp class in a place that has nothing to do with architecture, you're gonna make friends that are um, within that learning community and they might not be architects. Um, you know, that's important. Architects stay within architects. <laughs> All their friends are architects. That's yeah. not the best way to start, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> cool great and i don't see any hands yet uh so this is also a reminder that you can post questions in the group chat um and then maybe i will ask something a little bit more general because something that many graduates are currently facing um which i guess was maybe similar to the last recession is that no matter how incredible your portfolio might be no matter how passionate you might be about design and architecture firms are just not hiring um, and I think this has been a source of incredible frustration among many of us, but it is also an opportunity to rethink how and where we find work, how we find the people that um, we build for and kind of at the larger, um, the grander scheme of things, how we change the world. Um, so I think Fab Pub and your architecture practice are a great inspiration. Um, and I would maybe ask for those of us looking to start our own practices now because that is kind of the situation that we're in um what advice do you have for working out something like a business model or finding clients or finding funding for something like software or machinery in particular um and i know this is a pretty chunky question to start off with <laughs> and i hope that others have kind of um, but that's cool. That's cool. I'm yeah. happy to answer. Uh, you know, honestly, there's one book that uh, if you really have entrepreneurial desires, like uh, it's it's called Losing My Virginity by Richard Branson. Uh, this was, mm. you know, the the moment I realized that even a, a dyslexic guy who doesn't really understand numbers uh, has built a legendary career uh, and legendary businesses. And when you read that book, you're like, oh, my God, like this is this is something I can do, right? Like this is uh, this is special. And he tells the relationship with humans. He tells the the way he met people. He he tells his uh, and I, that was really just one of those moments where I'm like, uh, oh wow, okay, that's that that feels a little bit like it's possible. Uh, so I recommend reading that. Yeah. Um, that's just to answer the kind of more uh, how does it work. <laughs> it's always good yeah. to, read, to read a book. Um, apart from that, you know, doing a business plan, um, raising funds, um, you know, you're, there's a, 
it's not just the architects that do that, right? There's a wide, mm -hmm. wide, wide um, a bunch of like entrepreneurs out there that give conferences, meetups. Um, there is entrepreneurial platforms out there that uh, you could probably join. There are incubators. If you're interested in the sort of um, startup, obviously it's something that you'll have to do in parallel because right now as part one and part twos, you're learning early stages design, right? You're not even yeah. part three. Part three is a great course for entrepreneurial action because you learn about contracts, you learn about legalities, you learn about regulations. Um, if you have, I, I remember having a class, I really liked it actually at the AA where we were learning these things. And really it's, knowledge doesn't come to you, right? No, you have to mm. go and grab it. And, um, and I think that's really, really important because often we're, as a students, we're relatively kind of passive in a passive situation where, and I think that's one of the power of the AA is that it makes you active. It seeks, when, when your teacher says, go and find out, that's actually a blessing, right? I remember Zaha did saying that. She says, I don't understand. I used to be given assignment and now they just say, go and find out your own truth, right? Mm. But that truth that you're seeking is, is one that you're defining now. Whether you need to start a practice or thinking, I think it's it's maybe more important to think like why why you would need to. Is it really because you have no choice? Is it because you're applying to the wrong places? Is it because the way you're applying is also not necessarily. Uh, a, 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 I mean, to be honest with you, I receive like CVs all the time, and I can tell you that a lot of them do common mistakes. One, they mass email, they mass email thinking that somehow it's a it's a quantities game. It's not. Like, honestly, when I receive a very bespoke email of someone who truly understands what we're about, who watched the lectures I gave, who really has something to say about the way we, we do stuff, then of course I'm going to notice it. Like I receive tons mm. of emails. I look at my emails, but I just receive, dear sir, madam, uh, hello, anyone. Uh, I'm a great guy. Uh, I know everything. Hire me. Right? Like in, in essence, that's most of the series I receive, right? Compare that with someone who's like, I watch your lecture and that topic is something that's dear to me, um, especially this aspect of that project. Um, and, um, you know, I really enjoy the, the, the spirit and I've spoken to people that are in your practice and this and that and that. And then you're like, whoa, this person really truly wants to join us, right? Um, and of course I want to pick up the phone. Like it, it's, we're not necessarily hiring, but maybe I want to meet the, uh, meet the person, right? Uh, yeah. Maybe there is beyond just the act of hiring. There's just the, the, the act of just uh, relationship, friends. Like, I, you know, I, mm. I'm still friends with the entire Galaxia volunteer crew. And so, you know, sometimes it's also about um, sending the right thing to the right people and really knowing what you're passionate about and then finding the people that align with your passion uh, and build that community around you on that basis. Yeah, cool. I think that might answer uh, <laughs> one of the questions in the chat, which is, would there be any suggestions for applying for internships when taking your out? But I guess it's kind of similar. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. And, and specify that it's an internship and that you're here to learn and that you're early stages because it, it's, it's, it's not easy, right? I mean, I used it, I know the whole scandal of unpaid internship, but it was much more fluid before. So we were, you know, I did an internship at Arup, I did one at Zaha, I did one, imagine the knowledge I gained, right? That's beyond any, any money really. Um, and, and so I didn't go on holidays, I sacrificed my holidays, but it's fine. Like that was my learning, my extension to my AA class, right? Uh, yeah. My teachers actually sent me to <laughs> different companies and stuff. The one thing that I'd say is super, super crucial because I saw a question on the chat on advice to first years. Mm. There is a bit of a theorization of architecture that I find. I mean, last thing I, when I went to the AA and stuff, like um, I've, I've seen some CVs of, you know, very, very, very abstract projects. One thing that I thought consciously when I was a student at the AA is I need to learn skills. <laughs> yeah. I need to know top range like software. I need to be in the geekiest units where I'm going to learn as much software as I can. I was in Diploma Unit 2. Every week we had a different software class. I, I learned crazy things. I learned ANSYS simulation. I learned like uh, generative components and like, and, and trust me, that's valuable when you get hired. Like right now our staff mm -hmm. is, learning, is learning Katya. I can tell you that no one knows if you know Katya, you know, email me because that is, for example, a skill that no one has. And skills, mm. skills are precious. It's, it's simple, right? Mm. Yeah. Okay, I will move on to one of the other questions in the group chat, which is, um, how have you found making that transition from being someone who purely creates to someone running a business? Um, 
oh, I think it says advice of finding the balance between administration and creativity. Oh, that's a fantastic question. Really, really great. Because that's a struggle. You know, I don't have a, a kind of ultimate answer that, that, that replies that I found, that assumes that I found a balance, but you end up managing a lot. Like you end up doing, um, you know, you become a kind of a orchestra director, I guess, more than, a, you know, than being in front of Grasshopper. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, and I do miss it. And that's also why I teach the, um, it's again, it's about your human relationship, right? Like, so you're talking to people, you create teams, you, you kind of discuss ideas and, and once you start letting go, which I guess you understood is a big aspect of my journey, the learning how to let go, um, then it's not about you anymore. It's not, you're part of something, right? You're part of something that's not just you. So the idea that you're not uh, an individual creator, uh, and yeah. replace that with a collective that kind of uh, em like evolves form and, and creates a portfolio of things together. And like, of course, you don't lose your personal soul. Like, of course, all the project has some of my soul and, you know, and that will always be the case. And that creates a, a thread, a unit in the in the project and then in the in all the projects that we have over the years, you see that we can connect the dots afterwards. Right. Um, but mm -hmm. But the idea that you have a creator and it's one person and then that if someone else does something, then it's like this, this kind of weird kind of conflict of ego uh, is very yeah. dangerous. It's very toxic in our profession. Uh, ego is a, is a real toxic element of architecture. And, and that's why I think we all need to be super humble. We all need to acknowledge that the engineers, the contractors, the metal workers, the, the guys downstairs, the guys upstairs, they all have something to say that's as clever as you, if not more. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I mean, oh, sorry, I'm just reading. Um, there are many, many thanks coming through in the uh, chat. Thank you, guys. It's a pleasure, really. It's uh, it's an honor, really. I'm, I'm so happy. Like, it's um, it's. It, <laughs> I'm so happy I have something to say or share. You know, because I it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. It was super hard work, and uh, I just I hope you guys can you don't have to necessarily go through the steps that I went through. Uh, so I'm just making, it's a little bit like one of those uh, teachers when you learn surfing or something, you know, I, I failed so many times, maybe it's better <laughs> to hear it from me. <laughs> well, then maybe on the question of failures, yeah. what do you think has been, have been maybe some of your most instructive failures where, you know, I don't know if you started FabPub in like other forms before you got to kind of a point where it started to work or um, kind of, the obstacles that you had to surmount that like maybe required a few tries before you found success let's say yeah 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 um honestly failure is something that happens all the time it's not like there is like one big failure uh i can think mm. of so many failures that it's hard to list them all like I, I, I see failures very in a very positive light. Like every time I see stress moments or uh, when you know I get panic attacks sometimes. I, I'm I'm relatively sensitive and I know mental health is is a big thing during COVID. So I can tell you that it, you know when you get into that mode where you feel overwhelmed, you're growing. So yeah. so so it's positive, right? It's positive. Mm -hmm. You guys are are young, you're experiencing rapidly changing stuff, like it's overwhelming and you're growing and, and you're pushing yourself. Otherwise you wouldn't be overwhelmed, right? If you were comfortable yeah. and like, oh, <laughs> and, you know, and then you're not growing. So being in that position, and I, and I realized that a little bit late, right? But when you're in a depression, you're, you really, you're in your bed, you don't want to, yeah. you don't want to go, <laughs> like you feel like everyone judges you and you're the worst in the world. But really what I was doing is challenging myself to a level that I was making myself grow. And mm -hmm. by formulating what was going on, by kind of understanding it with time, I realized that this, these were actually precious moments. So I'm, I'm kind of glad I went through that, although it was super hard. Yeah. 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 I think many of us can attest to it being really yeah. hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, so keep, maybe keep it up. It's okay. Oh, yeah. You'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we're getting uh, each other through this. I think that's really important too. Um, but okay, I'll move on to a few new questions in mm. the chat. Um, one is, what are your long-term plans or ambitions, either e okay, either personal or business level? But I guess uh, architecturally, um, maybe where I'm guess. Oh, this is Boris. <laughs> oh, Boris! Yay. Um, <laughs> Maybe where you see um, your design ambitions going in the future. 
Uh, to be honest, what's kind of interesting is, um, you know, that sort of growth in size. Well, yeah. it's something that is ultimately relatively natural. Like our projects get bigger, the stuff we do gets uh, just, a, I think it's, it's a natural evolution of what we're doing, which is the machines are getting bigger. The people are starting to understand what we're doing. I, I'm really kind of interestingly, uh, not yet on a panic attack level, but uh, we're trying to become general contractor for two of our biggest projects now. And really, it's a big learning curve. Like to be in that level of risk when the projects are, in, you know, in the million euros mark, and you're just like, the just the price of the insurance alone is is extremely high, and you know that you're dealing with actual contractors who judge you because you're not a contractor, and. Yeah. So even at that level of um, development, I'm still facing massive walls. And it's the same walls I would mm. face when I started and, and shop and the experiential marketer said, oh, why are you doing show windows? It's not meant for architects. So every time you'll be facing adversity and people saying, don't do this, no, 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 no. So you really have to believe in that. You have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in what you're doing is important. It, it's the continuation of what you're learning at the AA. Like you guys are so lucky to be at EA. Like it's so lucky, and you know you'll all stay friends. And you know I, I'm you know Toby with who I teach. You know we were we were on the phone just now. I met him in the bar. Uh, I, yeah. I, I would say like you are so lucky to be in a place that values relationships that is relatively small. Um, and so sorry, I, I just went. Yeah. On, on a no, I mean it's all interesting. <laughs> so I, I don't think that is in any way problematic. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then there's uh, the newest question asks about coding, which I think you have said is really, really important for mm. architects now to learn because you know this, this, this will be for architects for the future. Yeah. Um, and this specific question is about kind of how do you approach it in your practice? Um, I think, well, I'm just reading the question, but um, maybe what kind of software do you use? Do you code your own plugins, that kind of thing? And like, how do you, maybe which software do you also choose to learn because there's an infinitely expanding number of code languages and softwares that you could yeah. learn yeah well they're all very similar uh i you know i recommend c sharp because it's like the the i guess the biggest one i guess i, I to be honest mm. i'm not even a programmer but I chose C Sharp because Grasshopper was written in C Sharp. So, and it was widely available and it's close to Java. So try to choose a language that is sort of a cross board, not to see this, but to be honest, whether you remove a semicolon or you declare a variable or not, it doesn't matter. Really, you're not, I mean, I don't know, maybe you are, but you're not at the level of uh, necessarily uh, having to specifically learn a code. You need to learn how yeah. to think in terms of code. That's something that when I was in Inter 8, for example, I remember my teacher saying, um, I don't want you to open uh, Rhino. There wasn't Grasshopper at the time. He's like, I don't want you to script in Rhino. What I want you to do is to take your model, which is a, you know, a, a model that we did from sheet material. And I want you mm -hmm. to write the recipe, like step by step, how you did it. And I want to know all the variables you could have changed. And do this in plain English. Don't open the software. Don't open the tools. Ah, brilliant. Eugene and asked us that. That was like, what an assignment, right? So I just went ahead. Yeah, I took a piece of paper, that sort of thickness, and then I cut it, and then I cut it with that sort of blade, and that blade had that thickness, and that, and then I folded. Can you imagine if you're able to document your process in a rigorous, systematic way? Because that's what algorithmic is. It's just mm -hmm. recipes. It's just sequence of steps that you can vary. So it doesn't matter. You know, yeah, of course, you know, Python is hot and you have all these platforms. Choose something that makes your life easy to learn. So if you find uh, there is this Code Academy online, do the Code mm. Academy class after you choose Python or C Sharp. Like, it doesn't matter because plus Grasshopper can read them all. So, um, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, and I think we're approaching 2 p.m. So um, any other burning questions that anyone might have, please send them through. Um, Okay, not many, uh, cool. none yet. Um, I don't know, but maybe, I know that the, maybe one last rounding off yeah. question. Um, I know that the AR had an issue not very long ago asking architects to write um, a letter to their younger self. Um, <laughs> what would be the one bit of advice you would give to your younger self? I think I would tell my younger self that you 
don't need to be so harsh on yourself um, and that you're going to uh, make sense of what's going on with you <laughs> and it will make sense and it will enrich your journey even more and so the suffering you have now or the pains you have now or the difficulties you have now are actually part of your growth uh, just like your actual physical growth this is just your brain making mm -hmm. space for more knowledge I would also say my to my younger self you know be humble like <laughs> stop thinking you know the answers you know um, there's this word that I like it's called conjecture is when you have affirmation without actually being able to prove them you just kind of it's this way <laughs> and then when you dig into it you're like yeah no it's not this way and and science you know makes you humble like knowing the numbers mm -hmm. like knowing that we don't know anything really because we don't makes you humble and I, I think this is something I wish I told my younger self because I think I, I thought I knew more than I actually knew <laughs> yeah I mean that's uh, great advice um, and hopefully I'll be able to take it on <laughs> um, so thank you so much thank for you guys. the talk uh, it's been really informative inspiring and thanks everyone for participating thank you guys um, I hope that everyone's kind of got so much out of it because I know at least I have. Um, mm. And just a word on next week's session in uh, this A Alumni Advice Talk series, we will have Edmund Foles and we hope to see um, everyone there. Um, and then please let other graduates know about this series of talks if you think they might find them useful. I don't know if Anna or Boris would like to say anything. Uh, just also, if anyone missed any part of the talk, it should be online by Monday. Um, so you'll be able to find it online. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank, 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 Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.